Our first case of a novel coronavirus confirmed in a person here in British Columbia. Coronavirus, it's been on our minds for well over a year now. Sustainability is conceptualized in multiple dimensions, such as environmental, social, and economic. When it comes to climate change and sustainability, where are we now and where might we end up? Today, I'm asking our faculty about our future after COVID. In terms of thinking about sustainability and the work that I do, it might be surprising for people to know as a health services researcher that this is actually a concept that's important to me. Oftentimes we're thinking about things like planetary health when we think about sustainability or the environment, but health services and health systems are actually part of the everyday environment that we live our social lives within. Greenhouse gas reduction is a global public good. It means it's a global collective action problem and you need everybody acting. And that's really hard. People with disabilities suddenly have found that their usual access routes have been, have been blocked by cafes and other, other uses. We don't resource the reduction of vulnerability. We resource reactions to devastation. The economy was hit hard during COVID-19. Jeremy Stone is the director of the Community Economic Development Program at SFU. In regards to kind of economic development and these like businesses, um, how has like the impact of COVID been? I mean, it's an interesting um, quote unquote disaster uh, because in many ways it doesn't have any of the, the major characteristics of disaster. Um, you know, it's not destroying buildings and it's not, you know, shutting down cities, et cetera, but it has these very individual effects on people and on businesses. And so, you know, I think it's been catastrophic for many businesses they have routines and they depend on those routines. They depend on Saturdays because customers are walking, you know, the commercial corridor on Saturdays. Um, and then when, when Saturdays effectively stop, like people stop coming out, um, then it, it disrupts their ability to make money, ability to pay rent, it disrupts their business models, their ability to pay loans, you know, like people are taking out debt to run their businesses and then, you know, they assume that they're going to have that many Saturdays for like five years. And when a whole year of Saturdays is taken away, it's it's a huge impact. What we've seen is that a lot of smaller businesses, especially local businesses, have appeared to be impacted more. Do you kind of like see um, them coming back like post COVID? Well, yes and no. I mean, I think that yes, in the sense there will hopefully always be economic activity. There will always be entrepreneurs who want to, you know, to provide us with our life needs because uh, that's what small businesses are. I mean, they're, they're, they're our providers of everyday life, uh, our food, our medicine, our clothes, everything. Um, but I think at the same time, um, we have a lot of businesses that have been impacted. A lot will go out of business. Um, and then other businesses and other entrepreneurs will fill those spaces. And so, you know, when we talk about, will, will businesses come back? Will economic activity come back? Yes, but we're gonna have a lot of people who suffer in the meantime, a lot of businesses that will go out. And, and I think our major concern needs to be, how does that function on, from an, a perspective of justice? How can we make sure that our most vulnerable entrepreneurs, our most vulnerable sectors of society are supported through this? And, and so it really remains to be seen, you know, how the impacts will be felt and whether or not, you know, those communities will continue to, to you know, suffer the impacts that, that, um, that others aren't necessarily. We've kind of seen the importance of like, um, I guess like the gig economy um, as like Uber Eats and like delivery and like, those things that kind of have, have really proliferated with people not really being able to like go outside anymore. Do you do you think that's kind of like highlighted the 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 precarity of um, I guess people who are like self-employed or like contracted out? This is a, a really big question, you know, because I, I think that on the one hand, um, you know, we have as a society as a society over the past 50 years have experienced increasing fragmentation of work. 
So, you know, work has been breaking down. The nine to five job is no longer, you know, the, the major job everyone has. Um, you know, people are becoming more dependent on bits and pieces of work. And so, you know, the Uberization of the food sector and, and whatnot is, I think, problematic. It, you know, at the same time, there are certainly people who are capitalizing on it and doing really well, you know, with it. And, and we're seeing, you know, Skip the Dishes and all these folks, you know, uh, bringing on these, um, you know, gig workers to do this stuff. And I think also, you know, now the shift to working from home, I think is enabled gig working in a lot of ways. And, you know, we, we don't need to necessarily have office space all the time. Um, but I think that rather than, you know, taking these as, you know, celebrating these stories and saying, oh, look, you know, at how we've, you know, got now all these people shifting to, you know, Uber driving with food, we should actually be saying, well, okay, but what does this really say about our broader society? Are all these people able to get, you know, their rent paid? Are they able to, you know, get enough money for food? Like, are they able to reinvest in themselves and their family? And, and I think, you know, the precarity is increasing. Um, we'll see, you know, uh, it's not just my opinion, it's we'll see what the data says, but um, I think just colloquially, uh, you know, precarity is increasing. But can you tell me a little bit more about um, building resilience um, in our communities? How do we like disaster proof our society? Is that possible? Disaster proofing would be awesome. Um, I think that, you know, the, the flip side of disruption or, you know, the you know, the, the counterpoint to disruption and disaster is vulnerability. And if we are, um, you know, you don't have a disaster if you don't have vulnerability. You know, if you have like an earthquake and none of the buildings fall down and none of the people get impacted, then you didn't have a disaster, you just had shaking. Um, and I think that whenever we look at any of these issues, um, whether it's a economic disruption or, a, you know, a natural disaster or something like that, you've really got to ask, well, how are people vulnerable and how are we mitigating that vulnerability and how are we changing the course of their daily lives so that they can be resilient and adapt to these changes? And and so I think, you know, if you're talking about how do we future proof our our economy or future proof our society, we have to be talking about, well, how, how uh, dedicated are we to social justice? How dedicated are we to equity? Until we deal with, you know, the fact that income inequality is so great and you know access to to life you know different life outcomes is so constrained by race and gender and class and all these things you know until we deal with that no we can't future proof you know we can maybe reduce the the risks from flooding or whatnot but uh, people will still you know be impacted by other forms of disruption mm -hmm.